Welcome to Canada's most irreverent talk show. This is The Andrew Lawton Show, brought to you by True North. Coming up, how governments are unleashing a snitch culture across Canada, a lack of transparency from the RCMP, and does reporting a killer's name give them too much notoriety? The Andrew Lawton Show starts right now. First they came for the non-essential businesses and now even the essential ones you have to ration your access to. Grocery shopping, which has become the highlight of most people's weeks, is now under attack in a way as the union representing grocery store employees is saying that you should only be allowed to take one trip per week and have one person for your household go to the store. And they say that shouldn't just be an advisory thing, but actually the law. This is a story in CBC News, Western Canada's largest private sector union, the United Food and Commercial Workers 401, which has 32,000 members says governments should bring in regulations that allow only one person per family in a store at a time and people should only be allowed to go once a week so if you're making a big pot roast or whatever or you are cooking you know chicken parmesan and you forget to buy the parmesan you can't just run back to the grocery store you have to go to another grocery store and I'm assuming this legislation wouldn't span all grocery stores, but who knows? I mean, if you're going to regulate how often people can go grocery shopping, certainly uh, you are. <laughs> I, just, I can't believe it. The, look, uh, unions have a place, and in some cases you have to really look hard to find what that place is. But this policy proposal I, I find asinine because, yeah, grocery stores have a bit of mayhem to them now. There's no denying that. But adding a law that makes it like you have to beg permission from the government to go to the store is not going to make things better. It's going to make things worse. Because I find, in my experiences, like I said, grocery shopping now the highlight of my week. Now, that was, I think, probably the case before the pandemic some weeks, but especially now. And... Sometimes it is a very different experience than other times. So sometimes you go in and it's pretty quiet and pretty calm. I went in last week and I learned that the toilet paper shortage is apparently over because it was just, you know, aisles and aisles and aisles or one long aisle, I guess, full of toilet paper and, and no one seemed to care anymore. So that part's good at least. But they have these arrows that are on the ground and I'm assuming that a lot of other stores have these where there's a right way and a wrong way to go down the onion aisle now or to go down other aisles. And the problem with this is that I don't think like the person who did the arrows really cared what they were doing at the one grocery store nearby. I think they were basically just putting down, I think they were tossing a coin basically. They go to an aisle and say, all right, is it this way or this way? They flip a coin and oh, it's this way. Because at, at a certain point, there are only arrows that are going one direction. So like you can't backtrack at all, but it's not even like you have the ability to do like a full lap around. There's a point where you pretty much get boxed into the dog food aisle. And let me say, I mean, we may have been pretty desperate at a certain point, but I hadn't gotten to there yet where I needed all the dog food. So I had to like quickly wait until no one was looking and dart the wrong direction from the arrow. It's like, you know, if you're going down one of those one way streets in Toronto in the middle of the night and no one's there, you just. I would never advise doing that. In any case, so the arrow thing, people are going along with. But sometimes, again, people are just minding their own business. I saw people get into a fight over the arrows. And it wasn't a huge fight. It wasn't like they, they weren't coming to blows over the jalapenos. But what was happening was actually they weren't even buying jalapenos. So forget the jalapenos. But someone had basically gone down the right way, the right way. And then they realized they forgot something, so they walked back. And then there was some guy about to turn into that aisle that, you know, started pointing to the arrow, and then they started, you know, swearing at each other, and eventually they both went the wrong way, which I found rather poetic as a resolution to the fight. The one guy just got out of the aisle altogether, and the other guy did his thing and, and then got out himself. But I don't like when we start distrusting each other as much. And I know I joked about it in the past show of the paranoia that you tend to feel in this climate. But when you start to take it out on other people, 
who are not doing anything all that wrong, you really are not going in a good place in society. And it's municipalities, provincial governments, federal government that has really emboldened this idea. You look at Toronto, which has launched in the past week its snitch line, and they don't call it that, but an online system where residents can report issues of COVID-19 non-compliance, including individuals not self-isolating, and operation of a non-essential business and construction site. So what they're saying here is, yeah, if you just see someone that's not following the rules, you just let us know. If they're not self-isolating, you just let us know, and we'll investigate and Toronto's trying to say that it's, oh, it's only just investigating these things and they're informing people and educating people. But what they're doing is inviting people to snitch on others. And you know there are a lot of busybodies that are looking for anyone that just slightly deviates, anyone who just walks the wrong way down the arrowed grocery store line, not people that are really taking it seriously and saying, yeah, that house party at Joe's house was probably a problem. Or yeah, that construction site, I didn't think that was supposed to be up and running and that's looking a little unsafe but when it's turning people against each other and you start to see that manifest itself for example in the grocery store we're not at a place in society that we should be celebrating and I would say further than that we're not at a place in society that is all that sustainable and I'd say the useless bureaucrat of the week is the bylaw enforcement officer in Ottawa, who it's always Ottawa. <laughs> Have you noticed this? That almost all of these stories are coming from Ottawa. So take a look in the mirror, Ottawa. A 17-year-old fined for playing basketball alone. Now, this story actually is insane. William Vogelsang was playing basketball alone in Ottawa at the Eva James Memorial Community Center. I don't know the community center, but they have a basketball net, and that's all that Mr. Vogelsang cared about. He was alone playing basketball. He thought that he was within the law. He didn't think he was being a little rebel here. He thought that, yes, I'm not in a group. It's not a mass game. I'm not doing a tournament. This isn't March Madness in April in a pandemic. So he was playing basketball alone. He's dribbling, juggling, tossing, shooting. I don't know what people do in basketball, but he was doing all of those things, presumably, because I think he's better at it than me. And then two bylaw officers come to him. So he's social distance. He's isolated. Two bylaw officers come into his space. Now, I don't know if they were speaking moistly or not. And I'm yes, I'm going to say that in every show from now until the end of time, probably. But they came and said, you're not allowed to be there. And he said, OK, sorry, I'm going to leave. Now, I would say that that in and of itself was the end of the story or should have been. But oh, no. The officers insisted they'd have to issue him a ticket because him playing basketball alone is just not allowed in Canada in 2020. He's never been in trouble. He said it's a big incident. He was embarrassed. And the irony is the reason he said he was embarrassed is because people were walking by, walking their dogs, watching this. They were fine. But him playing basketball, that was not fine. And then where things got tricky is the bylaw officer demanded to see his ID because he was just out playing basketball. He didn't have it. You need to provide identification under the emergency order that's in place in Ontario. So he said, my mother can text me a picture. My mother can bring it herself. But instead, the officers called Ottawa police who arrived 20 minutes later. The ticket, by the way, $700. But let's walk through what happened here. 17-year-old playing basketball alone. No one harmed, no one threatened, no one endangered, no one has the virus but him. If he has it, if he doesn't, no one has it at all. So let's say that that is all that's happening because it is happening. Two bylaw officers enter the mix. We've tripled the number of people on the basketball field. So we went from one to three. And now all of a sudden we call police because we need to get them in there to make sure the 17-year-old is who he says he is. You add probably two more officers there. And now we're up to five people. Now, now we're at the point where we're almost illegal as far as a gathering in Ontario goes. So him doing nothing but playing basketball by himself, you multiply it to have five people there, and that's the government's answer for endangering other people. It's just cram five people on a basketball court, give them a ticket for $700. Every single one of you should... Actually, no, I don't want to take aim at the police because they were just doing what the bylaw officers committed to. But the bylaw officers, you should absolutely be ashamed of yourself. There is no excuse for that whatsoever. So this is what's happening in Canada now. And if any anyone can say this is what's saving lives, 
I think there is some oceanfront property in Saskatchewan I'm going to sell you. Because when we look at the things that are happening as far as flattening the curve and the relatively hopeful and optimistic numbers we're seeing in Ontario's updates and other updates, yeah, a lot of these are because of social distancing measures. People that are staying home, people that are taking things seriously, people that are not having house parties, people that are not going to the office. These measures are not what is solving the problem, though. It's not ticketing teens for playing basketball. That's not what's flattening the curve. It's not ticketing a family for rollerblading. It's not telling a dad he can't play with his son in an empty park. These are not the things that are solving the problem. And I fear that governments are going to turn to all of these and say, okay, what we're doing is working, so we need to keep doing everything that we're doing instead of backing up and saying, all right, well, this was making an impact. This one probably wasn't. This was just boosting our revenue. This was just letting bylaw officers feel like they had something to do. Uh, this is not what we can say with all honesty is happening here because these cases are at best doing nothing. At worst, they're actually making it worse because you have all the bylaw and police that are coming to enforce these things. And, you know, the, the rationale, every time I say this, I get people to say, oh, but, you know, if one person plays basketball, then all of a sudden 10 people will. Fine, go after it when 10 people are. When, when William Vogelsang is joined by three, four people, then you can have a discussion about it. But when it's just him alone... Who's, who's causing the problem? The bylaw officers are. There is no problem inherent in what's happening here. So I'm going to just move away from this for a moment. But in all seriousness, check yourself if you think that these people around the country that are trying to cope with their quarantine, that are getting out and doing some exercise, if you think that they are at all in the wrong here, do check yourself. When we come back, more of The Andrew Lawton Show here on True North. You're tuned in to The Andrew Lawton Show. Welcome back to The Andrew Lawton Show. I want to shift gears here to something that is not coronavirus related and something that, again, I, I mentioned on Monday's show just breaks my heart, and that's the horrific, horrific attacks that took place in Nova Scotia on the weekend. Uh, even from when we talked about it briefly on Monday, the death toll has risen again. 22 people just senselessly killed by someone who was pure evil. I, I mean, there's no way about it to say anything other than that. He was pure evil. And... I wish that we could just focus on the victims. I honestly do. I wish that we didn't have to have a discussion that's bigger than what happened in honoring the victims, honoring the sacrifice of Constable Heidi Stevenson, honoring those whose lives were taken by this man. But the government of Canada, Justin Trudeau, Bill Blair, have decided they want to make this about politics. So I have no choice but to respond by having a political discussion about this. And the big battleground that I see here is going to be on gun control. Justin Trudeau, the day after Gabriel Wartman, the gunman, was killed, Justin Trudeau was talking about gun control. He had a press conference on Monday and on Tuesday as well, and in both was talking about gun control and said that, you know, the government was on the verge of putting more gun control in anyway, and then the pandemic happened. But now he's saying we're looking for the earliest opportunity, the best opportunity. So yeah, the bodies aren't even cold yet, and Trudeau is already talking about gun control, which means that anyone that is resistant to the government's gun control agenda has to step in and say, well, but wait, and I don't want to be doing this. I, and I truly mean this. I don't want to be having a political discussion on the back of this tragedy, but I have to because I refuse to let the government use the tragedy for political cover. And when they are saying it is justification for this, and make no mistake, Justin Trudeau is saying that, and here's a clip of that in just a moment that I'll play, when they're saying that this is evidence of why we need more gun control, we need to look at that evidence that they're basing this off of. So that's a big assumption there. That's assuming, that's suggesting that 
what Trudeau wants to do with guns in Canada would have stopped this from happening. That's saying that if, if only the Liberals had put their legislation forward earlier, then this would have been something that would have been prevented and preventable. And to say that, you have to be darn sure you know the facts of the case. And right now, police don't even know the type of guns, the number of guns that were used. At the time Justin Trudeau said that, police had a death toll in mind that was lower than the actual one. They were looking at, it was 15 crime scenes, and then they upped that to 16. 16 crime scenes at least. So police are saying they don't even know the details. And some of the details they do know, they aren't saying. One of those is a question that may seem insignificant to you, but I'll explain why it's important. And that is whether the shooter, Gabriel Wartman, had a firearms license. Now, I'm a gun owner. I know there are a lot of gun owners that tune into this show. If you are a Canadian citizen and you want to own guns, you can. You have to get a possession and acquisition license from the government. Now, if you have that, there are still terms and conditions and restrictions and various classifications, but you have to have that. That little card is the thing that makes it so you can legally buy and legally possess firearms in Canada. We don't know if the shooter had one of those, and that means that we don't know if the guns that he used were illegal or legal as far as his ownership of them goes. And this is a question that neither Bill Blair nor Justin Trudeau are prepared to answer. I'm going to play a little montage here of Justin Trudeau attempting to not actually not even attempting to answer and then of Bill Blair fielding the question and I'm just going to play them together because in neither do you actually get anything substantive. Sir, when you're talking about the gun control legislation, you brought up the tragedy in Nova Scotia. I wanted to know if you've been briefed on what kind of gun or guns were used in Nova Scotia. Do we know that they were legal? And based on that, um, how would your proposed gun control legislation have potentially prevented the shooting? Uh, there is still uh, a, a tremendous investigation going on by the RCMP right now. There are many, many different sites, uh, many different questions that a lot of people have, and I'm going to uh, trust the RCMP on uh, releasing information uh, as uh, as they uh, they feel it is important to. In regard to the firearm license, um, I I wouldn't think that anything investigative would hinge on that if you could release tell us whether or not that individual did have or did not have a firearm license Tim as as, as we've indicated the RCMP are in the earliest hours and days of this investigation and it's a complex one and and I think it's quite appropriate for them to be careful about the release of information until they've had the opportunity to verify it and confirm it. And and so it, it is, I, I think, inappropriate. And the Commissioner would, would quite naturally be very reluctant to reveal details of that investigation until it is complete. And so I would urge Canadians to be patient with the RCMP as they do a very difficult but very important job for us in getting all the facts, in, in confirming their evidence making sure that all of the steps to preserve that evidence are, are taken. Um, Canadians need to deserve answers. The families and the victims of these terrible crimes deserve accurate answers. And so let us be patient while the RCMP con conducts their investigation, confirms their evidence, and then I am absolutely confident they'll be transparent and, and, and forthcoming with that once that important work has been done. <laughs> I love that juxtaposition because in the one Justin Trudeau says, all right, uh, you know, we're not going to answer these questions. We trust the RCMP. And then in the next one, someone asked the RCMP commissioner and Bill Blair decides to answer the question instead and doesn't even give an answer. He just says, oh, what, you know, the commissioner is thinking is so he mansplained. Bill Blair actually mansplained to the RCMP commissioner there, Brenda Lucky. And in neither case do we get an answer. Now, the reason that this is important is because there's no investigative tricks that you need to deploy to figure out if someone had a firearms license. That's one of the first things police know about someone when they run their name in the system. If you get pulled over for speeding, police know if you have a firearms license. If they come to your home because of a noise complaint, they know if you have a firearms license. When there's a guy on the rampage and they have his name and they type it into their system, they know if he has a firearms license. So they know and just aren't saying. So it's not one of these questions that the RCMP has to figure out long term. No, this is an easy one that was answered in a few keystrokes. They just aren't telling people. They're refusing to say. 
Now, a part of this may be that police are just erring on the side of silence, which tends to be the role that RCMP plays. It's silence until proven otherwise. I, but it's also possible that the answer to this question is proving inconvenient or will prove inconvenient for the government. Because Justin Trudeau, when he keeps saying that this is part of his commitment to advancing further restrictions, he's effectively saying that he could have prevented this. That's the inference in what Justin Trudeau is saying. And Trudeau is still not saying, and neither is Bill Blair, the public safety minister, whether they plan to use an order in council for their gun control or legislation that goes through parliament. Now, given the liberals seem to have the backing of the other left-wing parties, even if it goes through parliament, it's likely to be passed, but at least it could be investigated. But when Trudeau says that word again, tragic reminder of the fact that we need to do more to keep Canadians safe, he is saying that we need more laws and more laws could have or would have stopped this. So his trust in the RCMP seems to be moot at this point because he's making decisions that go beyond the ones that police are making. And Bill Blair, his whole thing of, oh, it's early days, we can't talk about this. Why not? Why not? Now, again, you may think that I'm nitpicking here. And I am. I, I'm picking a very minute and minuscule detail of this to talk about. But I, I think it's important to do that because lawmakers have left me no choice. They've spared no time to politicize this tragedy. They're cramming it into their pre-existing narrative that has nothing to do with saving lives. It has even less to do with the legacies of the victims of the Nova Scotia attack. And they're doing this under the auspices of keeping Canadians safe. And it is a farce. It is a sham. They are not keeping Canadians safe. What they're trying to do is rationalize the already restrictive gun control measures they want to put in place that go beyond already restrictive gun control measures that are in place. We already have strict gun control in Canada, which is why mass shootings, which is why attacks like these are so rare in the first place in Canada. You reach a point where it is... Uh, safe to say that legislation is not the issue. And remember, this guy had broken so many laws, not the least of which is murder, of course, but impersonating a police officer, acquiring a police uniform. He got his hands on a police car that looked nearly identical to active duty RCMP cruisers. He was prepared and committed. And I don't say that to give him any commendation, but to say that if you think something as simple as a regulation would have stopped this, you are lulling yourself into a false sense of security. And it may be easy to think that. It may be easy to believe that or comfortable to believe it, but that doesn't make it true. And if he was illegally in possession of firearms, no amount of gun control would have done anything. Now, I want to get to some of the facts here, because I, I've seen some misinformation about this. There was a, a story in the Toronto Star and also Rebel News picked it up that Wartman was banned from owning firearms. Now, this is true and not true. So please listen, because I have so many people, I wrote a column about this and I had so many people that didn't even read the column. They just responded with some detail from another story that wasn't mine. Yes, in 2002, he was convicted of assault, but he was granted a conditional discharge which means he had a number of conditions he had to meet, and nine months later, those conditions were lifted. That was the term of his conditional discharge, nine months. And those terms were, yes, that he was, quote, not to own, possess, or carry a weapon, ammunition, or explosive substance. So that ban would have been over by October 2002, which was almost 18 years ago. Now, that doesn't answer the question of whether he had a firearms license now. It does say that he was not banned now that we know of. He may have had a, a different restriction, but for all accounts, it sounds like he had no restrictions in place. That doesn't mean he had a license, though. So he was banned 18 years ago. No evidence that he was banned now, which means he still may have been a legal gun owner. 
And I'm not committing to a path that says he is or isn't. I'm saying we need to get some transparency and we need to have politicians and police answering these questions. I'll take it from either, preferably police, given that when the blockades were happening months ago, the liberals made this big show of, oh, we don't speak for police and we don't uh, answer questions that are meant for police and we don't direct police on what to do. But then one question that touches on a government political priority to the RCMP commissioner and Bill Blair swoops in and decides to answer. So it's amazing that that uh, firewall between police and politicians is only when it's convenient to have a firewall there. And once politicians want to be ordering them around, that firewall is completely gone. So the RCMP said that Wartman had no criminal record, which is very likely because if he was given a discharge, he would, as a matter of fact, have no criminal record right now. Even if he did have a criminal record that was showing, so not something that was discharged or pardoned or expunged, it's possible to get a firearms license. It's very difficult. You have to disclose it. When they do your background check, they will see it, but you have to go through some other steps and hurdles, and it's not a guarantee. Firearms ownership in Canada is not a political right. It is granted. It is a privilege, and it's something that could be very easily revoked. So all of this is to say that we don't know. Anyone who says they know for sure that he did or didn't is probably wrong. He wasn't banned, but that doesn't mean he was licensed. And the reason this question is important is because this situation is being crammed into a political narrative from Justin Trudeau and from the Liberals, and that's something that we need to discuss if they're going to bring this into the political realm. So if he did have a license... It would still reveal some cracks. It would reveal a failure of the system in some way, potentially. Or it would reveal that we could look at aspects of the licensing. For someone with a violent conviction to get a license, how did that happen and should it have happened? And the answer is probably no. But if he didn't have a license, it proves that the gun control regime is entirely irrelevant. So that's the thing. I mean, either way, I, I don't think it changes too much the, the overall point here, but it does make a difference as far as how the government decides it's going to attack these things and how the government is going to go after them. So if you're not a gun owner, it doesn't matter. This is about due process, and this is about government politicizing a tragedy and hijacking a tragedy for its own political points, but they're not even doing it with a backdrop of transparency. When we come back, more of The Andrew Lawton Show here on True North. You're tuned in to The Andrew Lawton Show. I want to ask the media to avoid mentioning the name and showing the picture of the person involved. Do not give him the gift of infamy. Let us instead focus all our intention and attention on the lives we lost and the families and friends who grieve. You just heard there Justin Trudeau talking about the media and asking the media not to report the name and identity of the Nova Scotia killer. Now, this is something that as a person in media, I have a bit of an issue with, and I'll talk about this in a couple of moments, but it really does touch on a no notoriety campaign that's been going around mostly in the United States for the last several years, and the campaign that basically aims to take away the notoriety that the media tends to bestow on the perpetrators of mass killings. I want to talk about this with someone who had actually introduced me to this in the wake of the Parkland shooting a couple of years back, and that is Professor Jacqueline Schildkraut. She's the author of the book Mass Shootings, Media, Myths, and Realities, and a professor at the State University of New York at Oswego in the Department of Criminal Justice. Professor Schildkraut joins me. Thank you so much for your time. Really great to talk to you. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. So the no notoriety campaign seems to be based on this idea that if you give killers fame, it's going to embolden future killers. Is that a, an accurate summary? Um, yeah, for the most part. I mean, if you think about it, when we look at, you know, these individuals, and certainly in the case of the Nova Scotia shooter, it's, you know, still very premature. We don't really know a lot about, you know, him in particular. Um, but a lot of these individuals who go out and create or convict, sorry, 
a lot of these individuals who go out and conduct these types of very public, you know, events or public shootings will tell people in advance that they want to be famous and they want to have their name in light. And so it's sort of a twofold thing. Certainly, we don't want to incentivize other individuals to go out and carry similar acts. But at the same time, we don't want to reward people for doing something like what these individuals are doing. I guess the big challenge that I have with the, well, I guess there are two. When a politician is asking the media to do it, that part of someone in the media Mm -hmm. uh, doesn't necessarily sit right with me. But there is still a prerogative for media outlets themselves to come up with these policies and guidelines. I I think we can look at some absolutely horrendous examples of media doing what I would say is glamorizing. I I think that Rolling Stone cover from uh, one of the Boston bombers a couple of years ago is, is probably one of the more noteworthy examples of that. But I I guess what I would ask is, is there a way that the reporting can be done more respectfully that doesn't need to manifest itself as a a blanket ban, even if it's self-imposed on reporting names? Well, so I think that there's, you know, a couple things to take into consideration. Number one is that even the No Notoriety campaign, which was started in the aftermath of the Aurora, Colorado movie theater shooting, has never said complete blackout blanket, no names ever. You know, there is an invest, you know, there is a value in reporting that as a fact. But I think where the issue comes in and where notoriety is really speaking from is you can say it once in the beginning of the story and then simply refer to them as the perpetrator to continue to name them over and over again or to put up their picture. Um, You know, that's where you're putting a face to the name. And the reality is, is that you can still tell the who, what, when, where, why and how of a story without having to give somebody credit for doing something so horrific. Yeah, I think that's actually a really important point because a lot of the time when we see these stories, a lot of, like I would say media reporting tends to go down the killer, the shooter, the perpetrator anyway. So to do that with a bit more intentionality wouldn't be that much of a change, but it would make a difference, it sounds like, in that overall notoriety that the killer is getting. Well, you know, one of the things is is that, you know, you have these individuals who are relatively unknown people, and in many cases, completely unknown outside of their own social circles. And so what they're trying to do is they're trying to make sure that people know their name. Um, for instance, I grew up in the Parkland community, and our shooter, literally before he went into the school, said, I want everybody to know my name. I want, you know, to be famous. And lo and behold, that's exactly what happened. There's nobody in this country and probably the world that doesn't know what his name is. And so if you remove just the identity component where you're not giving them credit for something like that, then that can be very helpful. You can still say all of the facts of the case. The perpetrator, for instance, in Parkland went into this building. He had this type of gun. He did these actions and this is how many people died. But you're not giving that individual that, you know, that credit or that glory. What's the view that you have on reporting things like backstory and history of killers? Because I think a lot of the time that's where, in some cases, coverage can look like it's glamorizing or romanticizing a story. And I don't think that's necessarily the intention of these things. But do you think that there should be some hold ba- holding back on reporting those life stories of some of these people? You know, I don't necessarily think that there needs to be, um, you know, for me as a researcher, you know, because we don't have access to a lot of, you know, investigatory documents. And oftentimes there's not as much available to the police that there is to the media, which is always very interesting. Um, There is a value in having that information. Um, You know, if we understand what led up to, you know, uh, zero point, then we can try and identify opportunities for intervention in future incidents. I think where it becomes a challenge for those of us from the no notoriety camp is number one, the way in which it's presented, you know, certainly this over glamorization, kind of like you mentioned with the Boston bomber, like we don't need to know if they wore affliction t-shirts and had tousled hair kind of thing. Um, We just need to know the facts. But also I think that there is such a overemphasis on the shooter rather than also an an equal acknowledgement at the very least equal acknowledgement of the lives of the people that they took. And, you know, we tend to think about this one individual and all of the bad things that they did, but there's not as much attention paid to all of the good that they took. And, you know, we talk about victims as, you know, numbers, right? Uh, Columbine, they're one of 13. Parkland, they're one of 17. Now in Nova Scotia, they're going to be one of 22 or whatever the final death toll ends up being. 
And the reality is, is that they're not one of anything. They are humans. They have stories. And those stories also need to be told. That's so key. And I'm glad it's something you've done in, in your work as well. And, and I know that it must be very difficult for you having to rehash some of these things. But, you know, I've seen you mark anniversaries and, and bring victims names. And, and for me, I mean, I have to admit that I get a bit ashamed when I look at some of these victims that you talk about from cases going back years. And I could tell you the shooter, but I couldn't name a single victim from any of these cases. You know, it's really interesting. Um, after Parkland. Um, which obviously for me is a very different sort of beast, if you will, because it's where I'm from. Um, I can remember being in a meeting in, in with one of our task forces here, and there happened to be a reporter who's done a lot of key, uh, stories for the New York Times. And she just kept rattling on with the Aurora shooter's name. And at that point, it was maybe a month out of the shooting. So personally, on a personal level, I was very raw. And I literally said to this room with like the most high-powered people in our city, listen, we're on the fifth floor of this building. I will bet you guys every penny in my bank account, go downstairs and ask anybody the Parkland shooter's name and then ask him to name, ask that person to name one person that he killed because they're not going to know, but I know all 17. And I understand that my connection is different, but, you know, even just learning about one victim, you know, I've gotten to not only, you know, learn about them and share their stories online, but many of the families I've connected with, I've learned about Hannah Ehlers, from Beaumont, California, and her three ch amazing children and her husband, and, you know, all of these different people that had lives and had stories and people who have lost loved ones in very, very horrific ways beyond their control. When you look at that no notoriety campaign, if more media outlets and individuals adopt this, is there a risk that it could have an inverse effect where shooters that do want fame realize they have to up their game and be the worst and the deadliest and go so far that they would then get the notoriety they seek? That's a really interesting question. I think that, you know, we're sort of already seeing an element of that because they do hmm. study one another. Um, and certainly as my research has shown, um, you know, the media blanketly, of course, we used one source, but there tends to be a greater emphasis, even just in the amount of coverage or the placement of coverage of those shootings that are more lethal. You know, if somebody commit or kills two people, that's not going to be covered the way Las Vegas was with 58 people. Um, well, now 59 people, um, you know, and same with Parkland, you know, had 17 people. But earlier that year, the shooting in Marshall County, Kentucky had two people. They weren't talked about any which way the same. And so, you know, I think that we're already seeing that element. Um, so I don't know that removing that incentive would really change things one way or another, because if the practice was we're going to limit the name no matter how many people you kill, um, you know, certainly that might all just blanketly work. I mean, I, you know, I hope. Do you find that all of these shooters really are, are very similar to one another or is every shooter created differently? I think every shooter is created differently in many respects, but there also are similarities and the similarities come more within the way in which they go from, you know, seemingly normal person to mass killer. Um, there is a, uh, a model out there uh, from Dr. Reed Malloy, who is a pre preeminent scholar in this field, and it's called the pathway to violence model. And basically, if you look at, you know, each case, while there may be differences in terms of, you know, social or demographic characteristics, the general trajectory is the same. They all start with some type of a grievance, whether it's perceived or real, you know, something really happened, like they lost their job, or they think they're bullied, or they think they're ostracized, or, you know, whatever the case may be. And at some point after they're sitting there, you know, kind of festering on it, they make a decision that they're going to exact revenge against that grievance in a very specific way. And so then, you know, their pre-attack preparations tend to, again, follow the same patterns in terms of weapons gathering and probing and breaching into locations and seeing what they're going to do and their logistical planning. And all of these different steps along this pathway, which again, we learn about through the way in which their backstories are told, allows us to identify opportunities for intervention or for a way to de-escalate it before it becomes a full-blown shooting. 
In Nova Scotia, of course, I think the day after this shooting ended, we already had politicians talking about gun control, which in the Canadian context is already very strict. So it's it's not as uh, simple as linking it to, you know, how you might see a response in, in some American jurisdictions. Do you think it is too simplistic when oftentimes people focus on one aspect after one of these shootings? Oh, absolutely. You know, when we talk about mass shootings, there are a lot of things that all kind of go into play with it. Um, you know, there's a lot of factors and they all happen to converge at precisely one you know, point in time. You know, certainly there are people who will argue, well, if there were no guns, there would be no shootings. And that might be true, but that doesn't mean there's no weapons. You know, there's other forms of weapons. We saw in Charlottesville, Virginia, here in America, that in the absence of a gun, someone used a car. Um, you know, the same day that Sandy Hook happened in a, at a Chinese elementary school, somebody knifed 22 children the exact same day. So, you know, offenders will find a way, regardless of what their weapon selection is, if they want to um, inflict mass, or maximum casualty or maximum harm. And so looking beyond just the means to what is the reasoning behind it is extremely important. And that's why it's so multifaceted. It's not just one thing, but collectively as, a, as in not only our nation, but I think within the world, everybody seems to hone in on the very first thing because that's the easiest thing to go for. Everything that is going on in the process that leads them up to it is far more complex and it needs a much more protracted and long, long ranging conversation. One of the things that I certainly see in myself, and I'm sure you see it in a lot of other people, is that there is this desire for answers, and nothing ever satisfies that. And how have you come to terms with this? I mean, you're immersed in this more than anyone else is. How do you, in your own mind, kind of find peace with this when you just see the evil that exists in the world? You know, um, I appreciate you asking that. I don't actually get asked that a lot. Um, I think for me, really kind of, again, focusing in on the victims and saying, what can I do from my little place and my little corner in the world to make sure that other families don't have this happen to them? What can I do? And so for me, since Parkland, um, you know, I've been very focused on emergency preparedness training. Um, when I learned about the fact that, you know, kids in that building had never, ever been through a lockdown drill. The teachers had received very minimal training. And from my perspective, had either of those things happened, that may, that shooting may have had a very different outcome. So I've spent two years training school districts on how to respond in these events. But also, I think for me, is just realizing that the conversation needs to change. And I work really, really hard to change that. Um, you know, one of the things that I learned in the last two and a half years is the most dangerous Thing in all of this is not the gun. The most dangerous thing in all of this is the mentality that it can never happen here. Because the minute that you say it can never happen here is the minute your your guard is dropped and you've become extremely complacent. And that's when it, it, it can or, you know, maybe is more likely because you're not as, you know, aware or, you know, kind of thinking about what's going on around you. And that's really the mentality that I've been trying to change. And I still hear people say, it. you know, one of the big things right now that's come out in America, and I don't know if it's come out up there, is, um, well, there were no school shootings in March. Well, there was no students in school. So no kidding. There was no school shooting. But that doesn't mean that we're not having mass homicide and we're not having all of these other issues. We seem to, as humans, only be able to focus on one thing and that very worst thing, but not think about all of the other things that are going on. So I just try to use the platform that I've been given to educate people to call these types of problems into focus and hope that even if I can change one person's perspective, it will make a difference in the long run. Well, I think that's a very worthwhile perspective, and I'm glad you were able to share it and also glad you were able to uh, take the time to speak to us today. Joining me on the line, Professor Jacqueline Schildkraut, professor in the Department of Criminal Justice at the State University of New York at Oswego, also author of the book Mass Shootings, Media, Myths, and Realities. Professor, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. My thanks to Professor Jacqueline Schildkraut and to all of you who tuned in to the show today. You can reach me, Andrew, at andrewlawton.ca. We'll be back next week with more of Canada's most irreverent talk show. Thank you, God bless, and good day, Canada. Thanks for listening to The Andrew Lawton Show. Support the program by donating to True North at www.tnc.news. <laughs>